Welcome to the final session of Restoration Works. The title of this session is The Flow of God's Kingdom. And in this session, we're going to sum things up by looking at the big picture and praying for the body of Christ in the earth. And we'll begin by talking about the concept of unity, uncommon unity. An alarm pierces the night. Men scramble out of their bunks, yank on their clothes, and try not to trip over one another as they scurry to battle stations. Officer Mack makes his way toward the control room, adrenaline pumping through his veins. Every soul on the submarine is now in his hands. They have trained for hours just to make the next few minutes go smoothly. Now, as he steps into the room, someone shouts, Officer on deck! With the obligatory salute, all soldiers turn their attention to him as he orders, set course, 180 degrees. Immediately, the conning officer says, set course, 180 degrees. Then the helmsman calls out, set course, 180 degrees. As the vessel turns, the helmsman shouts, on course, 180 degrees. And the conning officer responds, 180 degrees. And to watch a scene like this unfold in a group of battle-proven men who are under intense pressure is a, an amazing experience. It's a picture of uncommon unity. Most successful military operations have similar protocols. Many businesses that are engaged in dangerous endeavors and Many emergency responders do the same thing. They listen for and they repeat it back to ensure that everyone on the team is in complete unity. It's a beautiful thing when everyone cooperates. Lives are saved. Everyone on the team understand that, understands that those who give the orders are human. But more is accomplished through unity than could be accomplished if everyone was trying to get their own way. I wonder what would happen in a local church or in the body of Christ at large if we adhered to that method of operation. What if everyone responded to what God said by repeating the same thing? What if every preacher preached what the Bible said instead of their spin on what the Bible said? What if elders in the church accepted direction from their pastor without arguing for their point of view? What if a, a man could be anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach and the congregation could be anointed to hear so that when the preacher said something true, the whole congregation would agree and maybe even say, Amen. Now, obviously, the first step toward a world of unity rather than obstruction and sabotage, is to come into an agreement as to who is in charge. When societies or churches or families or even individuals demote God from commanding officer to some consultant, then things begin to break down. When they begin treating God's word like a, an ordinary book of Proverbs and myths, then the enemy quickly gains the upper hand because Confusion rules the day. Truth be told, we're in a war between good and evil, and God is trying to speak into our lives. It's also true that the enemy is always trying to divide the troops, and he has a legal right to mess with people that are out of order. For example, Jesus was God in the flesh, and he spoke the truth, but Judas, who was one of his disciples, was off base. Although he tried to talk himself into thinking he was right, he was not submitted. And he ended up betraying Christ and eventually committing suicide himself. Whereas the other disciples, all 11 of them, followed Jesus to the best of their ability 
And even though they were confused at times, they submitted completely and they turned their world upside down. If the 11 did it, we can do it. It all starts with complete trust in God and in those that he has called to lead us so that we can live in an uncommon unity. There are several biblical analogies that imply the need for unity. And they begin by acknowledging who is in charge. For example, the church is called the bride of Christ. The implication is the groom is in charge. He's called our Heavenly Father. We're His children. The implication is He's in charge. He's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we're His people, so He's in charge. He's likened to a master of a vineyard, and we are His servants. In every one of those analogies, it starts with Him being in charge and us just saying and doing what He says repeating what he's saying, obeying with him whatever he says. And that kind of unity will change your church, it will change your family, and it will change the world. In every case, it's his lordship and respect for those who are in authority that are key to the flow of God's kingdom. So let's practice that right now. I'm assuming that you and I both are willing to be restored. If we're really willing to be restored, as we end this series, we can feel good about some things. For one thing, if we're really being honest with God and we're really willing for Him to do whatever, we can be honest about everything with ourselves. We can tell ourselves the truth. We can look at problems as they are. We don't have to fear the truth because we're being honest with God. If there's a problem, He can fix it. Secondly, we can let God's Word judge everything. Every thought that comes to me, every feeling that I have, every impulse that I have, everything that anybody does or says needs to line up with the Word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, I'd like to read that same verse from the New Living Translation. It says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So if I'm willing to be restored and I'm willing to let the Word speak, then the Word of God is going to help me tell what's Him and what's me, what's the enemy and what's me. I'll always judge it by the Word of God. Another thing we can do if we're willing to be completely restored is we can live and pray deeply, transparently, from the very depths of our soul. You and I, if we pray deeply, we can let God be our comforter and our counselor. If we're praying from the depths of our spirit, then when we're angry, we pray about it. When we're bitter, we pray about it. We, we pray about the feelings we have. We're honest with God about those feelings. And God can come and correct, or God can come and affirm us. He can reassure us. He can even compliment us because we're being honest and transparent with Him. When we're shallow, when we're pretending then God can't really do a deep work in us. But when we get honest and when we pray deeply and when we live deeply, He can give us a power and inspiration that comes, like we said earlier, out of our innermost being. It flows. He goes deep and all those things come to the surface and they flow out of our lives. Another great, great benefit to being restored is we can live guilt-free. I may still have issues to work on. I may still have things that need to be fixed in me. But since I'm on this course, since I'm giving God 
the free access to my life. I can feel guilt-free about things. I can live knowing I'm doing my very best. And lastly, we can live without fear. Now, I want to take just a minute with this and talk about a few people in the Bible who let fear clog them up or cause them to not align with God. Abraham was a great man of faith, but there were two occasions on which he was afraid for his life because someone would want to kill him to get his wife, and so he lied. He had fear. David was afraid when he was being chased, and so he pretended to be a wild man. He acted crazy instead of trusting in God. Israel came to the Holy Land, and there was a whole generation of them who never were able to go into the Holy Land because they were afraid. They were afraid of the giants. They were afraid it was too hard. Saul was afraid of David, even though God had anointed him because he was afraid David would take over the kingdom. And so David took a bad path in his life because of fear. Lot's wife was afraid when they were leaving her home, so she turned around and God turned her into a... Peter was afraid when Jesus was at trial, and so he denied Christ three times. But later he repented, and God was able to restore him and use him. Jacob and Esau were afraid, and so uh, Jacob cheated, and Esau forfeited his birthright. Just There's all kinds of stories in the Bible of people who were imperfect, and those that allowed God to heal them, or those that repented and took care of it, they were able to go on and be who God wanted them to be because they didn't have to be afraid anymore. Now, I'd like to close with this illustration. Let's suppose someone had this motorcycle and it was fully restored, but they'd never ridden a motorcycle before. And so... They were afraid. They were afraid they wouldn't know how to work these brakes or wouldn't know how to shift it or wouldn't be able to control. Maybe they wouldn't be able to keep their balance. Well, even though this machine was working and even though it had gas in it and there was power and they could go somewhere, that fear could actually lock them up and keep them from ever riding a motorcycle. The only problem would be fear. You and I may have an issue, it might not be fear, it might be uh, some of the other drives we talked about, it may be some of the addictions that we alluded to, but each one of us, if we're willing to be restored, and we cooperate with God, especially in those areas of life that we have a hard time with, God will be able to ream us out, and clean us out, and help us to align, and flow through us, so we can be honest, and we can let His Word judge everything and we can pray deeply and we can live a guilt-free life without any fear. As we close, let's talk and pray about this.